Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Please take a seat. And we shall begin. So I'd like to give you a really warm welcome to day three of MOVE Congress. Yesterday was full of energy and participation, but we know that day three of a Congress can feel a little bit whew. So to give you a little pick-me-up, the International Association of Sport and Culture has given you a little something sweet on your seat, a little chocolate, just to give you a lift this morning. So thank you to Iska for that little something. I've also got a note to talk to you about this pile of skipping ropes in the middle of the stage. For those that were here for the opening on Wednesday, we did lots of skipping and we have some rope left over. So what we're going to do is to donate that rope to the primary school that helped to run some of the evening activities yesterday as a thank you. So that's my little reminder to tell you that it's going to a good cause. So without further ado, I want you to be introduced to our next speaker. And we're going to begin with a video, because I understand that this is how this guy rolls and gets out of bed. So please, let's have the video. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to introduce to you Magnus Scaving from Lazy Town Entertainment. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I don't wake up so early like uh, normally, but. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you very much. I'm not sure you cannot learn anything from me. I'm not really sure, so don't write any notes. But I'm going to try to explain a little bit my philosophy and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I my name is Magnus Kevin. I basically was so lucky. I played a moving superhero during the day, and by the night I was a CEO. So it was quite interesting actually. I come from a very small town. It's so small, there was four people in my class. And we couldn't even make it to a football team, it was not even possible. And if you want to get married, you say, you want to marry me? No, because it was only like two girls. You want to marry me? No, you're out. So it, it, the town is so small, it's so, yeah, it's there. There it is. It's really small. And I even come from a smaller country called Iceland, and we barely made a football team, but we made it to the world competition. It was quite nice. You only need 11, so how difficult can it be? So, in what I want to do, I really want to do something. 
I want to do something like uh, for movement. I always love to move. So I went on a mission to basically motivate families to make healthy lifestyle choices. So I really want to move kids. I want to move families, and I really want to move the world. This was an idea. This is like 30 years ago when I was young. Uh, so I created something called Lazy Town. And Lazy Town is a town that everybody is really lazy, but they're, uh, they're lucky because they have a superhero who actually is motivating them, to, motivating them to move. And then you have this guy called Sporagus, and then you have a girl called Stephanie, and she's a new in town. And then you have Robbie Rotten, who is the laziest villain on the planet. He is trying to get people not active. And it is amazing with people who don't want you to move, they make enormous effort that you don't move. It's unbelievable. So Robbie is maybe the most active guy in the whole place. This is the whole gang. So people ask me, because you created Lazy Town, you must be lazy. Do you never sleep in the middle of the day and take a nap? And I say, yeah, yeah, I do that. That is healthy. That is not lazy. Remember Yoko Ono and John Lennon? They were in bed for, for about 10 days a week. They were not lazy. You're not necessarily lazy if you lay down and sleep is maybe good for you. You are lazy when you don't care anymore. Then you're really, really lazy. So you say, I'm not poor. I don't care about poor people. Or you say, I, I, I'm, I'm a grown up. I'm not a kid. I don't care about kids. Or you say, ah, I don't live in Iceland. I don't care about that country at all. I live in England. Or you say like, Anything, you should care about everything. Everything, you should care about your town, you should care about your, your parents, you should care about everything. Every single thing matters. Because when you don't care, people can feel it. They can see it. It's exactly the same if I don't move this part of my arm and I come in and I say, hello, how are you? You would see immediately there's something wrong with my arm. And people see immediately when you don't care. They can see it in your eyes. I don't know if you have ever played a Santa Claus. Have you played a Santa Claus? So when you play a Santa Claus, you have all this stuff in your face, but they still can see in your eyes, ah, it's not Santa Claus, you're faking it. You're not really good, you're drunk. <laughs> Almost. So, but there's huge power to be lazy. There's enormous power because one person can drag the whole team down. One, even, one president can take a country down, or a one human being. There's enormous power to be lazy. It's enormous. So I think we should lean forward all the time. We should really, really lean forward. We should be leaning forward in life like this every single day. I need a very handsome man. Can you please come up? Come up, jump on the stage for me. So I need the help here. What's your name? Andreu. Andreu, how are you? Fine. So I need your help. Can you stand and lean to me now? Lean to me. Yes. Look, this is how Andrea should be every single day of his life. And you also. Every single day, you should be like that. And everybody should feel it. Be you. <laughs> <laughs> because no one, nobody, really wants to do a business with somebody who is sitting down and doing this. OK, you want to buy this car? <laughs> Even if you go to Japan, they sit like this. And they're having a in the meetings. We are from Iceland, we are sometimes doing all kinds of things, but this shows that you're leaning forward. Because when you know where you're going, if you want to take and you want to move people, you want to do something, if it's something you want to do, automatically this is going to happen. Lean forward. So if I let him go, <laughs> he is going to step forward, otherwise he's going to land on his face. Look. Or he does a push-up, <laughs> which is actually quite nice. <laughs> yes. But there is a reason he's moving forward. If he would fall and step, he would go. If he do a push-up, he can do 500 and keep going. But there's one thing he's not doing. He's not standing in the middle. A lot of people lean in the back. Because they are like, no, you cannot do it, it's not possible, no, it's horrible, it costs too much money, you cannot do it, you can never do it. So I'm going to go really back. A lot of people are in the middle, and normally women are in the middle. You know why? 
because men are a little bit more stupid than women. And they say, <laughs> women are much smarter. They, are, they, are, they know they can do it. But men would say, I can do it. They do it. Women are like, of course I can do it better than this guy, but I'm not sure. What about this and that? They're always thinking. So I would say to women, lean more forward and ask for more money. <laughs> you should do this. I want 10,000. I want a million. Because you can do it, it's after the show. Thank you very much, Anders, thank you very much. So lean forward. It's extremely important to lean forward. You can see it immediately. So, why should we move? Why are we meeting together to move? Why? Why does everybody need to move? Why is that so important? Why? Why are we like, you have to move? You have to move. Why? That is a big question. And. Let's go back in time. Let's go 180,000 years ago, or, or be, before Christ. What they did then is that they did one thing when they moved. And they did it exactly the same also 130,000 years ago, and also 90,000 years ago, and 60 years, and 30,000, even 10,000 before Christ. And even year one, they did it exactly the same. And even 1500, they did exactly the same. And even 1995, no, <laughs> 1950s. Almost for the last 100 years to 50 years, we are doing it differently than all the generations have done before. We are just doing it differently. The last 50 years, we are doing it differently. Because all, everybody who was doing anything about movement in the old days, they did it to do what? to survive, just to survive, that's it. And if you don't move, you're gonna die. So the main pressure who's coming, if I don't move, I'm gonna die. I need to move, change places, I need to hunt, I need to learn how to hunt, I need to climb, to shoot, or I need to do things. I really, oh, there's a big lion coming, I need to run. <laughs> so, Basically, you need to move. Nobody moved. <laughs> this is so much fun. <laughs> Nobody was doing that. Nobody. Nobody was doing, I need to really go and hunt, and this is <laughs> like high five. No one was doing any high fives. This was serious business. This was life and death situation. So 1950s, or maybe 100 years, or last 100 years, or maybe 50 years, this starts to change. And it starts to change a lot. And it starts to change in that way, we move because of different reasons. So I'm gonna name a few. I'm gonna name a seven, for example. There are much more, like traveling, people are, transportation, people go to work maybe on a bike, so transportation. But normally it's like this, <coughs> physical health, that's one reason. So it's a little bit like you know, it's good for your heart, it's good for your physical health, it's good for your blood, it's good for you. Knowledge, we, we, we are rest, the doctor tells us blah, 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 blah. Somebody comes and tells us something, we learn more, okay? There's basically mental health. Mental health would basically, oh, it, it, it take my stress away. Oh, it's very good, I feel good. Dopamine in the brain, okay? It's sports and games. You do, you play football or soccer or you, hobby, it's, it's a hobby. You, you're not doing any sport, basically it's a hobby. Or it's a social thing. You go walk with your friends around the neighborhood. That's it. But, or nature, you go explore the nature, you're gonna look, you walk on a mountain, you bicycle in the nature. Or it's a pressure. All the media is like bombarded with things that you have to have this kind of ass and you have to have this six pack and you have to have all kind of shit. And people are doing it like, oh, I have to get, get, get ass. Like Kim Kardashian, she's doing this. And it's ridiculous. I was almost 20 years in the fitness industry since I was 16 till I was like 30. And I've never seen more unhealthy people than actually in the fitness industry. They're extremely unhealthy. Because they're like, the, the main purpose was to shape the body to, to be something. They, they don't understand, if I did a push-ups or if I do something, automatically I get six packs. That, that's a bonus, it's not the, that's what I'm aiming at. And I'm not aiming at to get a great ass, it's ridiculous. But, there is enormous pressure. You cannot open a magazine, boom. You cannot go to the social media, boom. 
the pressure is there. Absolutely. So, all of this what we are doing today, we want to do it, all of this together, we want to do it, and we want to do it how? This is different. We are not going to survive. Nobody's going, <laughs> maybe yes, it's possible. If I don't get the ass of Kim Kardashian, I'm going to die. It's possible. But if you put a trans implant, maybe you're going to die. But, <laughs> but why? Why, why are we doing this today? We are doing it because we want to have fun. We want to, it, it, it's, it's an entertainment. It is like we want to do it because we have our physical health and everything, but at the same time we want to have fun doing it. We want to yell, woo hoo, woo! We want, to, we want to have fun doing it. We want to smile when we do it. So we need new ideas. We need new ideas for schools, entertainment, gyms, nature, everything. We need the new ideas. Crazy, lot of ideas. And that's where you come in. <laughs> you are the people who are going to create this and fill the gap next thousand of years. You're going to come with new ideas, like boom, 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 boom. That's what we need. That is a reality, because the entertainment, the train is already left the station. So you need to be creative and do, 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 to motivate people to move. That is a reality. That is a reality. So, let's say 180,000 before Christ, our body developed skills to survive. This is what we know. And, the, and what we did, we learned a lot of skills. We learned, we went with our parents or, or, or to hunt. We learned how to climb a tree. We learned a lot from the other people in the village. And we learned how to behave. And there's a certain things. If you didn't do this, you're going to die. You, then you, you, you're dead. And then everybody said, don't do that again. Let's do something else. Don't do this jump. You're going to die. Okay, we're never going to do that jump. And the body keeps it in the memory, in the DNA. We keep it. We know this is a generation for generation to generations. So we learned a lot, but the body is so smart. It's extremely smart because the body is extremely lazy. The body, is, this is really, that's why we are struggling with this. That's why you are here. The struggle is because the body tells you, don't move. Because he wants to save energy. He is thinking, for millions of years, it's a survivor, so if I, if I come a lion, ah, there's a lion, I need to run as fast as I can. Then I cannot be doing jumping jacks for pleasure, and then the lion comes, <laughs> I'm dead. So they say, don't move, because you're going to use it. You're gonna, you need that energy to get away, you, to survive. So basically, the body takes all this in and keep this for years and generations to come. We learn that. And the body knows, if you kill the body, he's gonna take over. So he has a thing in the body that maybe you are stupid sometimes. You're like, ah, oh my God, I got a stupid head. <laughs> so the body thinks like, oh my God, I got this guy. He's doing something really stupid. So I'm gonna take over. I'm really gonna take over. And what do we do? The perfect body takes over. So let's say, for example, you work too much. You go and you work like crazy because you have to be at work. You have to get more money. You have to work. What happened? The body has to tell you, don't work so much. And you're, yes, I'm going to go up and work more. And the body tells you, don't go to work. And yes, I'm going. And then suddenly the body says, I need to do something with this guy. I'm going to put back pain. And you're like, oh, I've been working all day and all week, and now I have a pain in my back. And if you don't see that, you, don't, you ignore the signals, you have a problem. The body is going to say, we have a stupid guy here. So I'm going to put something. What about we put black under his eyes? Because I know he's brushing his teeth every morning, and he has a mirror. And he look at himself. He cannot be that stupid that he can, because he can maybe not see the back problem, but he can really see his face. Okay? So I'm going to put black under his eyes. But still you go to work. You say, have a little makeup, and then keep going. You don't listen. And we don't listen anymore to this. And if you eat bad food, drink too much wine, eat something bad, what does the body do? It takes over. It's not because of you say, ha, now I'm really drunk. I really want to throw up. It's not like a decision. It's that you throw up. And even if you get a sand in your eye, just a little sand, even if you're going to be the coolest guy in the room, ha, I'm, I'm so cool. I'm really cool. 
but you are going to cry. The body is going to say, boop, boop, there's a stupid guy. He doesn't take it out. Let's put liquid so he can take it out. That's going to happen. And even, even if you, let's say you're going to be the coolest guy in the room, and they will be cold outside, you would go out and you tell all the group, I'm going to be outside naked. I'm not going to move. And you stand like, <laughs> everybody's like, wow, he's not moving. Yeah. Suddenly the body thinks, they start to think, wow, this is a stupid guy. <laughs> so the body takes over, boom, and he says, you start to do what? To move. Because you're too cold, what happens? You start to shiver. Body tries to start to move, because you start to make heat, because you are too stupid to make heat by yourself. Even if I put a hole in my hair and the blood goes, the body knows the brain cannot lose blood, so I faint automatically, so the blood goes to my head. This is how body is perfect, but we don't listen to it anymore. We are not listening to it at all. We just move on like crazy. So, move should be fun, but for the generations before us, a lot of generations before, there was one thing that was not there. That movement was fun. It's not in the DNA. The body is not telling, ha, there's a stupid guy, you have to move. Not really. He starts to send you sickness if you're going to kill the body, but if you're living a normal life, he's not pushing you to move. He's pushing you to lay down. So that's where our problem is. We are in between that you're not dying. When people are sick, they do everything. They eat, change the diet, they start to move more because there is a pressure that you are sick, you want to get healthy. But when you are healthy, you don't even know that you're healthy. So you, that's the challenge. So let's say kids. Kids know how to move because when you are the human being, deep inside, they really know how to move. Deep inside, they know. But for generation, they didn't know. They know how to move, but they didn't know this was supposed to be fun. But they liked it. But they were not allowed to run and laugh. <laughs> they were not allowed to do it. You have never seen a cowboy movie that people go, okay, guys, we're going to have a shoot down, but I'm going to take a run before. Just for joking. That's not going to happen. So kids know how to move. They really know how to move. And if a child doesn't move, you know immediately there's something wrong. When you look in a room and the child doesn't move at all, you know there's something wrong. So, but the kids know. And if you motivate kids to move, if you really motivate them, they move. If you come to a kid and say, guys, let's go, you have an idea, let's go to a theme park, a water park. The kids will say, yes, yes, let's go. They move automatically. So I believe if we motivate people and there's enough excitement, people are going to move automatically. They are going to do it. So our job is not to teach them all the techniques that you have to do jumping jacks like this. You have to do this. Not like that. It's about the motivation. So basically what it is, kids know exactly how to do this. We don't need to teach them this. For example, if when you look at kids playing, this is how they play. I'm playing. How would we play? This is how we, when we get older, we stop doing this. We stop picking things up like that. We do this. Till we are 32, we are like, ah, I cannot do it anymore. The pain comes. And the body tells me, ah, that's what's happened. So kids know how to move, exactly. So we need to create new ideas for kids to move. That's what we need to do. At the age of zero to seven, kids learn how to walk and talk and behave and everything. This is the golden years. This is like a swamp. They, they take everything in. This is the most important time to basically motivate kids that movement is fun. It's zero to seven. That's where it happens. If we can do that, they're going to stay with that for their lives. But if that time is boring, even from zero to 12, you go to school and you don't like the, gym, the teacher in the gym. And it's boring, you don't want to be in the gym, it's horrible, you want to be doing math. It's going to kill that movement, it's going to be fun. 
because it's not entertaining at all. So basically what happened, 100,000 years, our ancestors basically passed on movement to the next generation to survive. And they did it by teaching them different things. So I, I show you a little bit, can you do this? Can you do this up and down? This is the only movement you're gonna do now. <laughs> can you do it? <laughs> up and down, doink, 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 doink. Can you take the other hand? And can you make a set with the other hand? Like this, set. Can you do it together? <laughs> it's not because you're not good at it. You're gonna come later today and say, Magnus, fuck you, look at this. <laughs> like, that's what's gonna happen. So, so uh, you can say, we know how to do this, okay. So, but the reason why you cannot do it because you haven't practiced. So you need to basically practice and again and again and again and again. That, that, that's the case. So in the old days, you went with your mom and dad to hunt, you climb a tree, you were doing things with the whole tribes. This is what happens. So you learn on different skills. And, but to teach it, they thought, wow, we want to be better at this. We need to do something. We cannot go hunting and teach at the same time because then maybe the kid is going to die or the young person is going to die. So they start to f figure out how can we do it. And they use a technique called ears and eyes. And I think this is what is lost today. I give you for example, ears and eyes is that you really listen, either to a sound, you have to move after music, you have to go or something you have to, or we created balls. When it moves, it's a movement. We look the eyes, it's a fantastic ball. It's maybe the best training I've ever been on the planet. It moves and it's games and it's motivation, it's, it's fantastic. And the guy who found out that game, he should be a billionaire. Maybe he's dead, okay? So, ears and eyes, it's extremely important. So, they came up with something called dancing. And they put up in the tribes and everywhere where they are, they start to make folk dances. In every nation, there's folk dancing millions of years back that you have to, even in Hungary, you are, you are doing this, what do you call it, like in a circle, like you're doing, like to, you go, like to, you do all kind of this. And even in, in some countries, there's river dancing in some countries. They're line dancing, like in cowboy country. Yeah, let's go, they, they do. There are tribe dancing. There's all kind of things that you have to, we go hunting and we learn the dance and we do it. And even in the Ludwig the 14th, there was like a square dancing. There was like, you have to do certain things to dance. And if you didn't do it, you are kicked out of the castle. You have to do, you cannot fuck it up. You cannot be in the circle in Hungary and just do, oh, you're not going to do it. You're going to be, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You are going to be fired. We are doing this, yes? So it's a certain move that everybody do exactly the same. So you are training your body to move after an object when you are hunting. And if you can follow something who you are hunting, you can also follow a person who are moving and you follow. Or use your ears and eyes. That's what you do. So, it was good to survive and they, they taught people and everything, but it was also good for the military. Because they realize if we train people more, they can do more stuff. They can actually go and conquer countries. So even in the military today, everybody walk in line. They march. They don't really need that. Have you ever seen in the battlefield? They're never using it. What are they practicing? They are practicing that, that everybody have to do exactly the same thing. Kids don't do it today. Kids do whatever they like. If you're dancing in the old days, you would go to a lady, you would ask her to dance, and you start to dance, like a waltz, or you would do rock and roll or something. <laughs> but today, you're not even touching the person. You're in the bar, yo, oh yeah, you're not even close. There's a lot of smoke in the, in the discotheque, and you can't even see the person. Oh, where are you? Oh. She's gone. <laughs> so they're never doing anything that really needs to be done.
because they don't do that. They never practice like that at all. So, but it was not fun. In the military, it was not fun. There was nothing funny about this. Nobody was laughing. So now, we need to laugh. Now is the first time in history that we are doing movement without surviving. We are doing it because it's fun. So, let's say here, 100 years ago, let's take the AIDS group, 0 to 12. So what happened with this AIDS group, 1900? What are they doing, 0 to 12, in movement? Before that, they have been surviving, okay? So what are they doing? Kids, 100 years ago, they moved a little bit by their own. They may be climbing a tree, maybe walking around a little bit, and then they have to start to work. As soon as you can work, you're gonna work. So the movement was in the work. 13 to 60 years old, they did a tiny little of movement, very little, the rest was just work. And the old people, just work. Nobody old person could say, now I'm gonna stop working and do some exercises, yeah, no. People looked, are you crazy? So, 30 years ago, in the 80s, what happened to this group, zero to 12? It was exactly the same. Except kid was left on their own, parents sometimes, but not so very often. We parents, we told our kids, be quiet, don't move so much, go in the other room, go out, do something. We didn't say, yeah, move around as much as you can on the airplane. There's a crazy kid on the airplane, ah! You and I like, way, bravo, Pish. No, sit down. Here, now in the 80s, Suddenly things happened, extraordinary things. Suddenly it came like Jane Fonta. And she was doing like, maniac, maniac, woo -hoo. <laughs> Lot of exercises, all over, woo! <laughs> and she was doing all this stuff. And uh, suddenly sold 300,000 millions of videos or whatever it was, it was like crazy. There was a crazy, I don't remember how much it was. 300,000, and there was like, everybody was doing something. John Travolta came staying alive, everybody went out uh, and danced, and the grease came, and it was like, Wah! It was crazy, everybody was moving. So suddenly it came a decade that people start to understand, wow, maybe it is fun. Maybe you don't need to survive. Maybe I have more time. Maybe I need to do blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, there came a lot of food, who is a challenge for us, because then you have to move more because you're eating more. So, but still the old people 30 years ago, they didn't move at all, at all. So, I thought, because I was in this industry here, I was going around the world and tell people what was the next thing in fitness, blah, 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 there's a step, there's spinning, there's like whatever you call it. But I thought, maybe this is not right. Maybe we, I should focus on this group here, start early, with this group. So I thought, I need to start early to motivate kids that they want to move for the rest of their life so we don't have to always be uh, crazy. So why, in my case, we don't, if we don't start early to motivate kids about moving, it's gonna be a problem because the health system is gonna collapse. That is a reality. So certainly rich people can only be healthy. And this is a shit. And we need to change it immediately. So, we need to be positive role models. Kids can see us. I, I, I see parents who are locked in the computer all the day and they tell the kids, you cannot be in the computer. But they're all the time, always on the phone and they're telling the kids, don't do it, you have to move. So you have to be a role model, and the, the whole city have to be a role model, the whole town have to be a role model. Everybody have to be there, everyone. So you have to involve kids. So for example, let's say, if you tell them, they will for, forget. Show me, and I might remember, and involve me, and I will understand. So let's say you go, and I tell you about a football game, Liverpool, Manchester United, you don't really remember it 50 years. But if you showed me we went to the game, we would remember it better. If we played the game, if you were the guy who was playing, you're gonna remember it for life. So you have to involve kids 
immediately. Involve them. Don't talk down to kids. Involve them. And you can't tell kids, if you eat this, if you move, you're going to be healthy when you're 21. The kid is going to look at you. I'm never going to be 21. I don't even know if it's coming a weekend coming up. I have no idea. So kids don't understand that later in life something is going to happen. So my question was, can education for a healthy lifestyle be entertaining? Is it really doable? That was the question. I realized that 30 years ago, actually, there was no role model in health for kids. There was Popeye, Popeye and, uh, who eats spinach, but he smoked and hit people. <laughs> and you thought, maybe that's not a good role model. Maybe we need a different role model for kids. And there was no entertainment brand dedicated to kids' health in the world. There was none. And I always said, Lazy Town is number one in the health of children in the world. <laughs> it was not because we were number one. We were the only one. <laughs> so it was, I want to use technical ear and eyes. This is what I want to use. Uh, because I believed in it, to make movement fun. So I think age groups, zero to seven, they love, if you, if you study kids, you understand they like sounds. Like when they're playing. All kinds of sounds. So kids love sounds. They also love movements, what they can do. So, and they want to imitate live characters. They don't want to be a Mickey Mouse. There's no kids jumping, I am Mickey Mouse. No one. But they will be Batman, Spider-Man. They will be people that are alive that physically can do stuff. So, I'm gonna show you a movement we did in Lazy Town. It's this one. This is a sound with music, with sound that kids do before they move. And everywhere where I go around the world, kids show me this. And they, they come, hey sportsers, look at this. So, it could be if we want to do a campaign that if you put this in your phone and each time your phone rings, these sounds would come, your kids would move when you're talking on the phone. And your kid would be, ah, the phone is ringing. So maybe your kid is going to move. Possible. So my idea was health. And I thought it was going to be really easy. I thought health is where everybody wins. That's easy, the only thing I have to do is to explain health. This is going to be extremely easy. I explain health and it's gone. I put it up on a wall, everybody sees it. But when you read it, it doesn't say Paris in the spring. It says Paris in this, in their, their spring. And even if we write it up in the biggest poster, people are not going to get it. So when you think people understand you, they don't. So when you have all those ideas that you have, and you're going to introduce it to investors or introduce it to somebody, people don't get it. You think they do, but they don't. And you think, because you're talking about it all the time, but they don't. So what would you say is a, because the challenge was for me 30 years ago, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to explain health. What is a healthy person? If I run four marathons, I'm a lunatic or am I healthy? If I did 500 push-ups in one arm, I'm a lunatic or I'm a stupid or I'm a healthy? That's a big question. So what is a healthy person? I found out after millions of years doing it, I would say healthy person is a person in balance. That would be good, okay? But I'm going to explain to you. If we have football, it's very easy. We would, you are my... My, my specialist, and we are going to talk about football. We're going to explain football. I would say, okay, explain football. You start to say, you have to throw this, and you have to kick, and you can do this, 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 and we write it down. Punto. Finito. We put it on TV, everybody watch it, and we sell merchandising. So we explain it, show it, sell it. That's it. But if we change football into health, that's where the problem starts. So I would yell, what is a healthy person? Let's explain health. And we start to write. We think it's punto. Then somebody says, no, no, no. It's also healthy to uh, walk to work. Ah, we write that down. And then somebody, it's also healthy to bicycle to work. OK, let's put that. It's also healthy to swim to work. Who swims to work? 
in Bangladesh. Okay, so it's endless. It's like to explain love or explain humor. You cannot explain it. It's not possible. So, health, you couldn't put it on TV. Kids would never watch it. Business, what is the business? So you have something you cannot explain, you're not allowed to show it, and how on earth are we going to sell it? That was the challenge. So I'm going to, you have a paper? Do you have a paper? Take the paper. We're going to do this. Hold the paper, you're going to do a test. Are you ready? Nobody's going to fail in this test. You're going to hold it, I'm going to give you five directions, and you're going to do it. I'm going to explain how difficult it is to come with an idea. You hold it, you're going to close your eyes, you cannot open your eyes, otherwise you have to do 500 push-ups. <laughs> On the stage. Okay, you hold it. Okay, and close your eyes, five directions. Fold the paper in half. Don't open your eyes, turn it 180. Fold the paper to the left. Rip the left corner off. Fold it in half and rip the center off. And now, open the paper. Nobody in the room has the same paper. Let me see it. No one in the room has exactly the same paper. No one. Nobody has even similar paper. But there is possible there's one or two, and then maybe we should get married. So the thing is, it's not because you are really bad, it's not because you are bad, it's because my explanation sucks. But I said it all, I said, fold the paper in half, turn it 180, fold it to the left, take the left corner off, take it, fold it in the half and rip the center off. I said everything, but still you didn't get it. So the problem is that when you think people understand you, they don't. So I'm going to move very quickly now. So, this is the underground of London. This is what you need to do. You need to take it from this to that. This is what you need to do with all your presentation, everything you're explaining to people about movement. So, I tested Lazy Town for many, many years. I'm gonna go very quick. In Iceland, before I took it out of Iceland, I went to 3,000 live events, 52 different countries. It started as a book, it was alive, it was music, it was games, it was a radio station, we increased sales of fruit and vegetables by 22%, we did mini marathon. Obesity of Iceland went down, 1996. And I was in my sofa watching TV, laying down. No, I was doing push-ups, watching TV. And I was looking at the TV and the health minister of Iceland was on the TV. And they said, obesity went down, why? And the health minister said, because of lazy town. And I was like, what? What? And I, on Monday, I called them and asked them to write it down for me. And then the president wrote down for me how much impact it has on the country. So Lazy Town, we knew we had a solution when we tried it, the kids would move. So we made a TV, we built a, a studio, we filmed Lazy Town. We got Lazy Town in almost over 500 million homes, 172 countries, and won a lot of awards, BAFTA, Emmys, and everything. But the challenge was, is it was about health. And you couldn't sell to kids shit, plastic shit, and chocolate. Because you can see, the challenge is, next generation the, the, the is always going to live longer, life expectancy is always longer for the next generation. But now, in first time in history, it's possible that kids are living sicker and dying younger. It's first time in history. It's possible. So, 500 people obese, 155 million kids is going to be a lot. So, what are we up against? Kids don't know what to eat or Parents don't know what to buy, and the market is full of messages that nobody understands. So every single kids brand in the world is this. They are bombard kids with this every single day, with all kind of, uh, I'm gonna show you. I ask a lady to go and shop. I ask her to go in and shop, fill the basket in three minutes, only healthy, look. Three minutes, and she's gonna shop, only healthy. Nothing else. He went in. And in the beginning it was not a problem. And then it starts to be a problem. It was problem, 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 problem. And then the time was up. And even the basket was 
put things in it that was not really healthy. She was struggling. She couldn't fill the basket. It was not even possible. So I asked her to do it again. Now she has to shop only unhealthy. Cannot be anything healthy, but she has to be blindfolded. She cannot see anything. And she was supposed to shop only unhealthy. Nothing healthy. She had three minutes. She went in. She went in. And even she was struggling to find. Sometimes it was a struggle. She couldn't even find the basket. But she could easily fill the basket. She had 38 seconds left and the basket was full. So the reason is when your eyes are open, you cannot really shop healthy. With your eyes closed, you can shop. This is it. So basically, we need to turn health into a game. And that's what we did. We call it sports candy, lead by samples, millions of kids start to eat fruit and vegetables. We increased sales of fruit and vegetables by 28% in the UK. We did 41% again. We started in Mexico, 29%, etc., etc., etc. It's the highest export in Mexico with, with the food. 30 years ago, we arrived at the wrong time. But now we are right. So basically, the government are seeking out for advice, like coming, uh, Italy, Phil Calderon, Mexico, Prince of Spain, and, and even the White House, Michelle Obama. And, uh, and, but now there's a new guy in the White House. <laughs> and he's eating McDonald's. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be interesting. So, in the end, guys, smile. There's a massive change, and kids are moving. Kids are smiling. Kids are starting to understand that movement is equal fun. They do it. So we need to go there. I'm going to do now 30 seconds. Let's go really quickly what we have done, like marathon, round the world, all kind of campaigns. I'm, just going to, I'm not going to go through this. And I want you to, this is just things that we have done, from soccer to basketball to sports club to anything that 60 minutes to move. Round the world, we have done this. Uh, this was 24,000 kids who move with a, uh, with a pedometer who can move. Uh, challenge, there's all kind of things. An energy campaign, and this is just like a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go through any of this. Then I show you in the end, live show. Millions of kids were moving with a live show. You have to have an imbalance. Don't move too much. And the end is this. Today, our goal is to make kids have fun. That's your goal. You have to do it in the community. The future is this, the last slide. There is ismen, there's communism, there's socialism, there's capitalism. I think now today it's going to be naturalism. People are going to go back in time and go naturalism. In 30 years ahead, are you filming it? 30 years, it's going to be minimalism. That's what's going to happen. So, architectures are important. Because if an architect doesn't make the, the whole town look good, he's going to kill more people than anybody, more than an army. So I need you to st do this now, in the last. Take the person next to you, grab it and ask, what's your name? What's your name? <laughs> say, what's your name? You say, who's number one and who's number two? You say, you are number one and I'm number two. And you're going to do this. I need your help for 10 seconds. I have like 40 seconds. Okay? Close your hand. Person number one is going to close the hand like this. Close it. Really close it. Close the hand. Person number two have 10 seconds to open it. Are you ready when I say? One, two, and go! 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, four. Come on. Come on. Open it. Come on. And stop. Stop before you hurt somebody. Stop. <laughs> stop. Okay. Look. 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 Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. So look. Open it, please. <laughs> I, 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 I told you, I told you that you have to open it. I didn't tell you how you should do it, but you went straight into, oh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna kill her. I'm gonna take it. But maybe you just need to communicate, and then it's happened. Everybody stand up. Stand up, we're gonna move for 30 seconds. Okay, stand up. We're gonna do this. Can you do this? With this hand here. Muscle, can you do? Poof. Okay, the other hand. Poof. And up, boom. Because we're gonna do great things. We're gonna clap. Poof. 
We're going to run a little bit. We're going to jump this way, dwang. This way, dwang, and a superhero pose. Are you ready to do with music? Lot of volume, please. Okay, ready? Love what you do, guys. Have fun. And now we do it. More music. And. Thank you. Magnus, thank you so thank much. You. Can I present you with a small token of our appreciation from ISCA? Ah, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank keep you, you hydrated. Thank you. Thank you. So next, I would like to move on to Daryl Edwards, who is the founder of Primal Play. Please welcome Daryl to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> well, how can I follow that uh, remarkable presentation? Um, I'm going to be talking about how we can solve the physical inactivity epidemic in our children. And it's probably not going to be full of life and lots of laughter. It's actually going to be quite a somber message. Um, my clicker doesn't seem to be working. OK, great. <laughs> so physical activity, basically, we know it's good for us. It's good for our children, physical and mental health, and also academic ability. How much do we need for those under five? Anyone, what's the minimum recommendation for a four-year-old? Does anyone know? No one? <laughs> 60 minutes? Um, it's actually 180 minutes a day for those under five. We should know this, right? If we're supposed to be promoting physical activity for, for young children, we should know this. And interesting, the recommendation goes further. It basically says there should be no lengthy periods of inactivity except when they're sleeping. Remarkable recommendation. What about those between 5 and 17? It is 60 minutes per day, which many people are trying to achieve. However, for that moderate to vigorous physical activity. However, three days should be vigorous activity. And many programs don't actually hit the vigorous activity portion of that recommendation. And three days per week should be bone and muscle building activity. Again, lots of programs only focus on the aerobic component. What should they be doing for 60 minutes? There should be a focus on the movement quality, on physical literacy, not just the amount of calories burnt. It should be age appropriate. They should be developing their motor skills, the skills that they will carry them forward throughout life. There should be social interaction. There should be emotional intelligence building. There should be a lot of diversity. It should be inclusive. Everyone should feel as if they can play a part. It's a global problem. The World Health Organization states that 81% of school-aged children do not meet the minimum recommendation. 81% globally. That was in 2010, and it's worse now. Boys versus girls, 78% do not meet the requirement as boys, and it's 84% in girls. So boys fare a little bit better than girls globally. It's a global epidemic. Looking at the UK, when children are self-reporting or adults are reporting on their behalf, about one in three children meet the guidelines. When they're wearing an accelerometer, only 8% of UK children meet the guidelines. And as I mentioned in my talk yesterday, accelerometers only give us part of the picture. It does not cover the bone, muscle building, resistance, strength training part of the requirement. So many of our children are nowhere near hitting the recommendation. My background, I used to be a programmer. 
I worked for Microsoft in the early 90s. I was headhunted by an investment bank. They paid a lot more money, and that's where I stayed for quite some time. I became sick, I was very sedentary, and I certainly didn't have a love uh, affair with exercise. This is me now. I certainly do have an appreciation for movement and getting outside and enjoying nature. But, you know, for many of us, working out isn't working out. I have a TED talk on this topic. Why are many of us not getting the message, not taking the exercise pill? This is why. Well, certainly from, in my case, we tell everyone that exercise is exciting and not so fun. But I felt like this lady here, you know, I didn't go to the gym three times a week, even though I paid the membership to do so. Um, exercise was often punishing and painful. No pain, no gain. Not much pleasure. So I set about creating a program for myself that was about play, that was about joy, that was about excitement, that reminded me of my experiences as a kid, when I could play all summer long and wasn't worrying about muscle soreness, wasn't worrying about developing skills and being performant. The only focus for me as a child was playtime. But most of us do not understand what play is. As a definition, if you were to describe what play is, you may say, oh, I think play is fun, there's, there's something joyful about it, it's something you do when you, you, you have some spare time. But there's some great definitions out there. This is by Dr. Stuart Brown, who is a professor of play, a psychiatrist who studied play since the 1950s. And he states that the opposite of play is not work, it's actually depression. Without play, there'd be no arts, no comedy, no um, uh, f you know, fiction, no works of art, no laughter, no joy. That's the importance and relevance of play. And depression could be termed a self-imposed hibernation. I don't want to get outside of my cave to go out and play. That's what depression is being termed as in the research. So what are the five attributes of play in terms of play behavior? One, it tends to be something that you volunteer into. You're not forced to do. Most of our play activities for children, we force them to do it. They tend to be highly repetitive. If you're playing, you tend to find an activity that you like and you want to keep doing it. You could almost play it forever. There's no end point uh, that based on your own choosing. There's a lack of purpose. If you ask a child sometimes, why are they playing a particular game, they'll just say, because, just because. I'm having a good time, it's fun. That's the only reason why, that's the goal, is how I feel now in the present. It's non-functional. So f by this I mean, if I'm running, this might be a functional run. Efficient, very soft, very great for my joints, very graceful, non-functional, would be this, which is what kids do when they're running. Not very functional, but it's enjoyable. And also there's a state of being stress-free. So if you're highly stressed, it's very difficult to be in a play state. What are the three types of active play? The first is social play, social interaction, developing rapport, creating bonds, communication. The second is object manipulation. What can I do with this object? What can I create with this object? What can I combine with other objects to create something else? And the third is locomotion. How can I get from A to B? From A to B. And I would disagree in some respects to the previous presenter on this driver for movement only being about survival. Because actually, there's another driver for movement. And we see it in all animals. And that's play. The very youngest of children will blow bubbles, only a few weeks old. They will create play experiences without being taught what to do. 
A young child will be driven to explore their environment without being told to do so, because it's instinctive. We have an instinctive driver to explore the world around us. We have ludic genes, we have play genes that are part of our DNA. And this isn't, isn't just a human experience, it belongs to all animals. Um, I'm not talking about this newt here, <laughs> um, even though arguably they are playing on a Sony PlayStation, but looking at the research, even T-Rexes, there's evidence of T-Rexes playing. And again, even in this example here, it wasn't just about survival. They found that T-Rexes would play with discarded bones. They would eat, then they would use those bones to play 65 million years ago. So there was optional reasons to move that had nothing to do with external pressures. It was actually about joy. But we know what play is when we see it or when we experience it. Here's an example. This is friends, Phoebe and Rachel. Rachel in the blue, she's running, she's exercising, she's highly motivated, very serious, breathing in a particular way, wearing the right outfit, <laughs> wearing the right training shoes. Phoebe is having fun, she's playing, she doesn't care what she looks like. That's the difference between playing and running. And arguably, one of those is something we're more inclined to do, or not, as the case may be. But I certainly know what's more enjoyable just by witnessing this. So my definition of play is not the activity, but the attitude you have. And if you are in a playful state, if you present yourself in a playful manner, that in itself defines what play is. So play has deep evolutionary roots. Play precedes ourselves as human beings. And it doesn't just um, present itself in humans or mammals, but across all cultures, across all species, it's a common experience. It's part of our physical and mental development. And it can rarely proceed without it being fun and joyful. Again, a significant body of evidence in relation to this. But play isn't always about fun. Imagine I'm five years old, six years old, and I'm playing. Whilst I'm playing, I use visualization. I use my imagination. And sometimes my imagination is actually quite morbid. So I may imagine that I want to jump, and here I have a pit of snakes. And if I jump in, I will get bitten by these snakes. So it's really important that I clear this, and I might decide to balance, and there's no joy on my face. I'm not laughing as I do this. There's lots of focus. I'm very involved and present in that moment. So play is also a very serious matter. And that's something, as parents, we sometimes fail to realize. We see play as purely something that's done as superfluous activity, whereas actually for a child, it's very, very important. Here's a statement by Fred Rogers from the US, talking about the importance of play. And for a child, it's so serious, it's so important. For them, play is work. That's the work of childhood. And it's extremely serious uh, in terms of participation for them. So let's take a step back. Outdoor play in the 90s compared to 2007 in the UK. In the 1990s, 71% of children had a significant amount of time playing outside without adult supervision. In 2007, only 21% of children had that experience. In 2017, it's even lower. It's about 8% now in the UK. Children, we all want to be superheroes. Unfortunately, children are getting weaker. In 1998, not that far back, one in 20 children couldn't support themselves. Body weight hang. 
10 years later, one in 10 couldn't support themselves. There's been a 26% drop in arm strength, a drop in grip strength. And those factors aren't just affecting their, uh, them and their health at that age, but it also actually leads to differences in premature aging, in longevity, and chronic lifestyle disease as you age. What about climbing trees? You're three times as likely to be admitted to hospital in the UK and the US, and I'm sure it's similar wherever you're from. You're three times more likely to be admitted to hospital falling out of bed than you are falling out of, tree, out of a tree compared to a generation ago. Three times more likely to do so. And I'm not talking about bunk beds. These are just your average, normal beds that kids fall out of and they have no bodily awareness but to get injured and to be admitted to hospital. Children have lost their right to free roam. This is looking at some research at how far children are allowed to go from their home without parental supervision. In 2007, it was 30 meters. Probably you could go to the your parental car and back without parents supervising you. In 1990, it was 300 meters. Maybe the road that you lived on, maybe your back garden, you could go without parents having to supervise you. In 1965, it was three kilometers from your home without anyone knowing what you were doing. In 1940, it was 10 kilometers, six miles away from home. Remarkable difference in how we entrusted our kids just a few generations ago into comparison to what we do now. 75% of children have less time outdoors than prison inmates. 75%. I'm hoping some of you are alarmed by that stat. We give prisoners more free time to roam outside than we do our kids. We value the importance of physical activity for prisoners, but not for our children. How has it impacted their performance? A kid of 1975, the average kid in 1975, can run 1.5 kilometers, 90 seconds faster than the kid of today. Heart health has declined 5% per decade. Our solution, many times, is structured play. That means we have a specific time and place, specific location. It's organized by adults, it's delivered by adults, it's coached by adults. There's coach sporting activities. And 25% of our time, or our children's time, should be spent doing these type of programs. The other 75% should be unstructured play, which unfortunately doesn't happen. It tends to be just the 25%, which becomes 100% of their play time. What does unstructured play mean? It means self-directed. No one's telling them what to do including adults. We are not the best at making decisions as to what children should be doing in terms of free play. That's one. Secondly, it should be spontaneous. They'll do it when and where they choose to do so. They will do a wide array of physical activities. They will build forts and dens. They will climb trees. They'll play hide and seek. They'll play tag. They will always include a risky element. They're not looking for safety when they're playing. They're looking to challenge themselves and to play with risk, to risk assess, to resolve conflict, to work as a team, to work out what their skills, what their strengths and weaknesses are. They're also seeking joy, pleasure and fun. And this all comes about through unstructured play. And those benefits, unfortunately, do not come about from a structured play environment. So here are some other benefits of unstructured play. The free play environment actually does transmit and transfer to a sporting environment. It builds rapport, it helps them resolve conflict, both on and off the field. It improves creativity in the classroom. They're better able to make decisions, better able to make decisions around their free time. 
it contributes to healthy brain development. They're less likely to be siloed, more likely to be free thinkers, more likely to be, have a, an appreciation of different ideas than their own. So what about programs that we're implementing into schools where we see that there's some success? Many of us are delivering these programs. And there is a slight problem. One is, this is in the UK, but again this can be replicated in lots of studies globally, children suffer up to 80% reduction in cardiorespiratory fitness during the summer holidays. So all the good work that some of you are doing with your school programs, finishing up in May, June, July of a particular year, come September, come middle of September, most of those gains have disappeared. Because that activity that you're doing at school, they're not doing much at home, and then during the summer holidays, they're pretty much inactive. And poorer families are 18 times more likely to be suffering from this discrepancy in fitness level compared to families with more income. And there's lots of research, this is in 2016 published in The Lancet, that current physical activity interventions for children do not work long term. Six months, 12 months, 12 weeks, we try this for one year, we have a small pilot program, all really successful. But sustainability of these programs are remarkably poor in the literature. So let's talk about something a little bit more positive, about active play and how it affects our mental state, mental state of children. So we have endorphins. So endorphins are released immediately when you're playing. When you're working out, when you're exercising, endorphins tend to be released at the end of activity. So you feel good immediately when you're in a play state. Dopamine, so this risk reward hormone. Because play encourages risky behavior, and working out, is this possible, yes or no? Can I do this, yes or no? You have an appropriate dopamine response. It isn't like the one you get from a smartphone, where you don't have to do much to get that dopamine hit. When you're playing, you have to do something, you have to weigh up, is this something that I can do or not? Can I climb this tree? I reckon I can climb it, but can I actually get down? So you're constantly asking yourself those questions, and if you do get a dopamine response, it tends to be based on a calculated risk, with a significant reward. Cortisol, the stress hormone. So when you're playing, you have a reduction in cortisol. When you're working out, when you're really kind of going for performance, you can actually get elevated cortisol, elevated stress. So if you're in a stressful work environment, then you don't go to a stressful gym environment, you can actually stay in a hyper-stressed state. Serotonin, that's a feel-good hormone, activated, mainly outdoors, mainly activated by sunlight. Going outside to play first thing in the day and playing all day elevates serotonin response. And oxytocin, the love hormone, the cuddle hormone, this is activated through touch, which is why a lot of child games, childhood games have touch as part of it. Playing tag, pee back riding, helping each other out. This is part of the oxytocin release. Let's look at some play histories of some famous sports people. Wayne Gretzky. Most specialists today, if they partake in a sport, they tend to specialize at a very early age, get coached from a very early age to become a master. Wayne Gretzky, one of the greatest ice hockey players of all time, didn't specialize in ice hockey. He played everything else but ice hockey, even though he was fantastic at this sport. He used a tennis ball with his, uh, you know, instead of a puck because he recognized that that would give him better performance when he was playing for real. He would draw out and map out what he should be doing. He had a very playful approach to his game that many people couldn't work out. Jerry Rice is an American football player, one of the greatest uh, receivers of all time. When he was nine years old, dreaming about being an American football player, he used to play under his bed sheets with a ball and he couldn't see, and he used to throw the ball around and try to get a feel for the ball. And it helped him in his ability much later in life. The Williams sisters, have you ever wondered why they mastered such an amazing serve? I mean, they have serves just as good as many of the men in elite competition. And what's incredible is how they developed their serve 
was their father watched them one day throwing the tennis rackets. And of course, he wanted to discipline them and say, you know, you can't, you're damaging the, the rackets. But he saw that they were developing remarkable throwing ability. And he used that, he bought lots of rackets, and they actually st just started throwing rackets around to develop their serve. So play was an important part of their performance later in life. But this isn't about elite sports persons. We all have this play history. I have one. Most of my childhood was about play. Hopefully, most of your childhoods were about play. However, in a very short space of time, many of us sitting here deprive our children of the experience that we had as kids. Many of us will say, oh, I had a great time as a kid playing outside all summer long. Parents saying, get outside and play. Don't come back until it's time for dinner. But as a society, there's been a shift. We no longer enable our kids to have this free play time. So, we can recapture joy because it's part of our DNA. It's part of evolution to provide us this ability to interact and respond appropriately to our environment. We can trust our kids to make the right decision as we did even just one generation ago. What about technology? Isn't that going to save us? Technology is going to be the savior of humanity. This is going to be the solution for the physical inactivity epidemic. I disagree. And I love technology. I used to be a programmer. I have an Xbox. I play a lot of games on it. But it's not going to be the savior. And one of the reasons I say that is because, do you remember the Nintendo Wii that was really, really popular? Everyone had one. Now no one uses it anymore. Pokemon Go. Two years ago, every media outlet was talking about this changing the global approach to movement. All kids are outside walking over cliffs, walking for miles. They now have something to do using this device. No longer a part of most children's lives. Technology only seems to give us very short-lived, faddish benefits from promoting physical activity. Most people who buy a Fitbit put them in the kitchen drawer and don't use them. That's the reality. They're waiting for the upgrade. It entices us for a short space of time. Technology really isn't the solution. And this is another reason why. Because most technology seduces us to be sedentary. The PlayStation, PlayStationary, sit here, be engrossed, use me for convenience. Humans prize convenience. So technology enabling that, make it easier for me to do this. That's what technology does. But that seduction takes us away from what evolution gave us in terms of our ability to move. So we need to go backwards to move forwards. That's what we should be doing. We need to recognize that there is a driver to move that is within our DNA. And that driver isn't just about survival. It's also about celebration. People don't just dance because they want to copy each other's movement patterns. They dance for celebration. They dance to have a good time. They dance for mating <laughs> to mate with other people. You know, there's an important part of pleasure that is part of the movement process. And I would suggest that if we take a little bit of a view back to our recent past, we'll get some of the answers as to what we need to be doing for our children today in the present and reintroducing a more play-safe environment. So in closing, play was a part of our evolutionary history. Homo sapiens, pre-Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, uh, Homo hominids were all involved in this play state. Play was a significant part of our recent past. Play deprivation harms our children psychologically, mentally, socially, and physically. Lots of research on that. And this is why I propose that play must play a significant role in our future. And most of that has to be directed by the children themselves. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for a Q&A session. So if we can lift the house lights a little, and if I can have some lovely volunteers to grab the mics. Fab. So do we have any questions for Daryl about play? I'm hoping for some really challenging <laughs> and comfortable questions. <laughs> Just stick your hands in the air and one of our volunteers will head to you. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Daryl. Um, the graph that you displayed showing the um, distance young people can travel from their home. Yes. Given a large percentage of that is based on safety and travel, have you been to any areas that have managed to overcome the distance that young people are able to travel? from their home without adults? Yes, so there, there is a big driver now, uh, community-led uh, driver by parents in certain schools to stop this kind of helicopter parenting that, that is commonplace now. Uh, the best example is actually in Utah, in the, in the US. So in Utah, in the US, they've actually passed a state law called the Free Range Act uh, which is basically enabling young children to be able to free roam without child protection services being called, you know, without parents not being chastised for letting their children play. And I suppose, of course, there are more concerns about kids' safety now. There are hazards that didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. But I think it just means we've got to have a, a more unified community-based approach to ensure that we do have safe spaces, that we do have collaboration between local councils and schools and parents to ensure that our kids can't, can go out and, and play. But, uh, you know, I used to feel that, it, I used to think that this was purely about a safety issue, but there were some parents that will not let, if their kids are playing in the back garden, they have to be in the kitchen window looking out at their children, even though they're in a safe community. I've been to gated communities in the States where they, you know, no one can get into those communities, but they still won't let their kids go out and play by themselves. So, you know, we need to change this. We can't, we've gone too far in, in the other direction. Um, in the UK, there are lots of initiatives now trying to encourage street play, uh, free play, um, uh, removing traffic for a particular day so kids can go out and play sports in, in the street, for example. So, yes. So, gentleman at the back in a check shirt, if we can send a mic over there. Thank you very much. Thanks for your wonderful presentation. I'm Thank wondering you. what is, uh, what do you think about the recess recommendations uh, in connection with the unstructured play problem in schools, in school environment? Um, I, I mean, I'm an advocate for any, any increase in physical activity is a good, is a good thing. However, if the increase in physical activity is only structured, is only with adult supervision, is only indoors because it's too cold outside. That's a problem for our kids because there are issues with developing resilience. If, if I run indoors and I run outside, the health benefits of doing the same activity outside magnify exponentially. Everything from vitamin D from the sun to improvements in immune, my immune system by being outside seeing nature, you know, temperature regulation, there are all these benefits that come about by just being outside. And kids tend to do more vigorous activities when they're by themselves. So even as, as adults, you know, even as myself coaching kids, I do go into schools, it's really remarkable what teachers will say, these kids are not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to get out of breath, <laughs> you know, for example. They're not allowed to touch each other. You know, this is not allowed. And so if we have this climate of fear where children feel uncomfortable playing traditional games of tag or chase or climbing or playing, you know, you can't skip. You know, these are going to be being given to schools. There are some schools around the world that will not allow children to skip because they may fall. They may cut their knee. So I, I think there's this culture of fear that we have to roll back. And there is a, there is a sweet spot where we can say, okay, Let's not go crazy and, and do whatever you want, anarchy, but let's have opportunities for kids to be able to have some free play 
without adults being around. You know, let's give them some trees to climb. Let's give them some outdoor space that is their own. Um, let's give them the several, you know, some trust to be able to make the right decisions for themselves. And as parents, we need to really uh, change our approach because as adults, we feel we know best. And in this situation, I think we, we don't. And that's why many of our solutions are failing long term. You know, lots of these programs have been running for years, but physical inactivity is still climbing. You know, we've got more technology, we've got more programs, we've got more diversity of, of options available than ever before. Kids are not gravitating to them because I feel that's not what they need. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? We've got time for maybe one more question. Oh, there we go. No. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we're obviously on the other spectrum. We're the technology kind of things. Um, yes. and, it's a gr uh, and, it's, and it's great and it's lots of fun. Absolutely. <laughs> so what we look a lot at is um, the flow state. I mean, everybody's like the, when you're in the zone, which is exactly what you're proposing is like you play and you forget everything else and you do it for hours. Mm. Um, what's, what would be your prime examples of, of, because I'm thinking of what actually can people take home? how to put kids into the flow state, like while still leaving them, because you, you want to let them roam free, but at the same time you want to help them to reach that little thing. Um, so, so what, with all your travels and everything, what are the two, three things apart from technology um, that you would say enable that in the best way? Um, I suppose we have to create an environment that will enable them to make that decision for themselves. So, if we, it can't always be self-appointed, like, okay, I'm gonna do this for you so you can now play and hopefully you'll get into the flow state. I'm sure many of us know what it's like when you buy a present sometimes for your nephew or niece uh, of the latest, the latest kit, and sometimes they're more interested in the box than they are <laughs> the very expensive device. So in that instance, they found their flow state themselves. It's, it's not, you, can, you cannot actually enter the flow state with somebody else directing that for you. It has to be self-chosen, it has to be driven by an internal locus of, con of control. So we just need to pass back some of that control back to our children. And I think, yes, technology can be useful to facilitate some of those experiences. And I, as I said, I love the immersion of technology. But just, just think about this. The most amazing graphical, uh, sound-based, environment you can create with technology should still feel a poor relation to real life. The real smells, the touch. So very young children have this fascination already. You know, they can look at a leaf a million times and go, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. As adults, we teach them not to appreciate being in the moment. And I think that's the lesson that we want to be taking home away with us, is actually that present moment children have by default. They're mindful by default. We don't need to teach them meditation and mindfulness. They have this if we enable and allow them to experience that for themselves. Thank you. In a moment, we will move to the break. Before we do that, just a few bits of signposting. So, in this space, in Patria, we've got Discovering New Perspectives on Physical Activity Promotion Amongst School Children. That's the track taking place in here. And then in the Bartok Room is Opening New Doors to Funding and Support. It's a fundraising workshop. So those are the two options for after the break. During the coffee break, I think our speakers are going to be around. So feel free to grab them, have a chat, and understand more about the points that they've brought this morning. So the coffee break happens in a moment. It ends at 11 o'clock, and then at 12.30, it's lunch. At 1.15, we return to our Innovation Alley presentations. So there will be six presentations happening across three different spaces. 
The spaces are Bartok, List, and Brahms, and the details are in the app. So remember at 1.15, it's Innovation Alley. So I won't keep you from your coffee any longer. It's in the merry corridor outside, and we'll see you back at 11 o'clock. Thank you.